Hello, friends. Welcome back to Unfeigned Christianity, where we seek to find culturally aware, biblically nuanced, and Jesus embodying responses to current day issues. I This morning, um, the last few days, I've been dealing with a bit of a head cold and sore throat, and so I my voice sounds like a raspy smoker or bullfrog or something. I'm not entirely sure what it sounds like, but Sometimes it comes out really low. Sometimes it comes out kind of higher. So it, you never know what, what you're going to get. But I'm excited to have Gregory Coles on the podcast today. He is the author of Single Gay Christian, as well as No Longer Strangers. Two uh, really good books. Single Gay Christian, obviously kind of a memoir of his own journey and discovering that he's gay and in finding language for that and then uh, talking to people about it and processing through even the wrestle of like what to do with that like is does bible permit same-sex marriage does it not permit same-sex marriage so i highly recommend that book but then in 2021 he wrote the book no longer strangers and that's about community and belonging and definitely recommend that book as well i don't have a hard hard copy a physical copy to show you but both are linked in the show notes and i i really enjoyed this conversation we're we're, i'm going to split it into two different parts we talk kind of his story and 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 just sexual attraction and, and conversation around that and then the second part we talk about intimacy community and yeah even some conversation around singleness and community but there's a lot in it that's helpful even for those of us who aren't single, those of us who are married, and, and just a picture of the church that I think is definitely more biblical and a needed picture for us today. So without further ado, I'd like to jump into my conversation with Greg Coles. All right. Welcome, Greg Coles, to Unfeigned Christianity. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It is a pleasure to have you on. I was telling you off the air that I've kind of followed you secretly here for a few years. And last year was in the same room with you at a conference, but just a little too shy to to go say hi. But it's fun to have you here one on one. Oh, what a delight. Let all the listeners know I am just so scary to be in the same room with. <laughs> You are tall, I, and I'm I'm actually kind of short, so I was kind of surprised to see you in real life. I was like, oh, wow, you're, you've got height to you. I feel like, yeah, people who have only ever seen, like, pictures of me or seen me from, like, the chest up, you know, yeah, I think they are maybe a little surprised, like, oh, we didn't think you would be over six foot. Um, yeah. So, always a good time. Yeah, well, just just as a way of introduction here to, to get us going, I, I want to hear... I'm going to turn it over just to kind of hear your story in a bit. But Greg Coles, for, for my audience, uh, has written, I should have asked you beforehand, I know of two books. Have you written more than two books? Yeah, well, that, yeah. that gets into complicated territory. I have two books that are traditionally published relevant to this conversation. So, yes. Okay, yeah. Two books for um, our purposes. Yeah, for the purposes today. You You went to school for writing or literature, yeah, my undergrad degree was in communication, and then my master's and PhD are in English. So okay, okay. Bro- so all writing- broadly in the languagey field. Yeah, yeah, and writing was definitely kind of in the in the career path, regardless of of these memoirs. <laughs> yes, yes, I had always been interested in and uh, pursuing various writing projects over the years. Yeah, yeah. A single gay Christian came out. In 2017, I think. Yep. And that's the first book that I read. And then I, I don't have a hard copy of it, but I was listening to the audio version of No No Longer Strangers. Yes. Is your most recent. And that came out in 2020? 2021. 2021. Okay. Yep. And so just kind of telling your story of, yeah, obviously as a single gay Christian man and the the journey of finding identity and community and everything that 
that comes with that. I um, I'm trying to think where to jump. Well, yeah, maybe just a little bit more of intro for you. You for sure. you serve currently with the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is an organization that tries to help equip churches and church leaders, especially to tackle questions around sexuality and gender um, in a way that really honors the Bible well, really honors people well. So I am the senior research fellow at the center, which basically means that I just get to do, you know, some writing and speaking and editing and a bit of this and that. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds fun. Oh, it actually is very much fun. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to think, <laughs> I, I should have thought through this more. If I, if I tell this now or let you kind of, kind of share, but I guess I, we were talking a little off air, like some of the background of, of my audience and a lot of the, mm. the, the people in the churches that I circle in. And w one of the things that is maybe scary about this conversation is when you start identifying as gay or somebody start talking about being gay is, sure. does that, does that mean you're a firm gay marriage? And so one of the things that I've really appreciated about the, Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender is it provides a really robust biblical exe exegetical approach to the histo historic view, Christian historic view of marriage. Yeah. While also, I don't know, pastorally, I guess you'd say, like engaging in a in a very gentle, compassionate way, engaging people that are having these experiences of whether it's gay or uh, gender dysphoria or or whatever. I think that's primarily, you guys don't do a ton of stuff for like helping heterosexual people find purity. There's, there's enough other yeah, I would stuff say, out there. Uh, there's, there are certainly <laughs> times when the conversations we'll delve into are relevant to and hopefully helpful for, uh, heterosexual folks, but those conversations are not our primary focus. Yeah. So, but I think, I mean, in the end, so, so much of the conversation around sexuality, it turns out that I think a lot of the same themes are really relevant to everybody, regardless of who they're attracted to. So in yeah. that sense, I would like to think that, you know, the, 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 certainly the, the same, the same Jesus who has, who has wisdom for LGBTQ and same sex attracted folks also has wisdom for straight people. But yes, our, our, our work is primarily focused on that conversation about people who, uh, yeah, either who are attracted to the same sex to some degree or who experience some degree of gender dysphoria, mm -hmm. kind of that, that aspect of the conversation is our focus. Yeah. Yeah. Actually something you said, I think it was in a podcast interview one time about, yeah, I'm not quoting verbatim, but this concept of like to follow Christ, like we're all called to die. And so why, why wouldn't you be willing to die to your desire for sexual intimacy? I don't know. I'm probably not quoting it exactly, but that, that struck me when I heard that just even in terms of my own and how, how I've, it's easy for me to view marriage as like, oh, I, I get this sure. sexual intimacy, but either in that with my wife in my relationship with my wife, or just in general, like, am I viewing my walk with with Jesus as a call to die. I just hadn't really thought about it that uh, maybe in like mi in terms of mission work and like going, you know, being willing to give up the luxuries of the West or something, but in terms of like your, my personal walk and, and just hearing someone being willing to forgo that really challenged me. And so absolutely the, the things that you have learned about sexuality are very applicable to, to any one of us. So. I just like if you could share with us from the beginning, like what, yeah, what's your story? What has this been like? And yeah, we'll kind of launch into different conversations from there, but just have the floor. Yeah, yeah. Well, to give sort of a, a broad contextual frame for my life, and then we'll dig more into the particulars around my experience of sexuality and kind of how I've <clears throat> processed that uh, as a follower of Jesus. But broadly, I was born in upstate New York, like very upstate New York, where it's basically Canada and <clears throat> lived there for three years. And then uh, my family moved overseas to Indonesia. When I was three, my dad was an English teacher. And so I grew up in Indonesia 
and lived there until I came back to the States for college and then studied communication for four years, uh, worked for a church for one year, uh, went to grad school, pursued a PhD in English. After that, I worked for a church for another two years in, in Pennsylvania and then recently have moved out to, to Boise, Idaho, which is where I do what I'm, what I'm doing now, the work we were talking about earlier. Uh, with the Center for Based Sexuality and Gender. So that's kind of like the, the broad, you know, those are the, those are the moves I've made in life. So it's within that context of growing up in Indonesia and, you know, being homeschooled because that was sort of the, the best educational option we felt of the options that were available to us in Bandung, Indonesia. It's within that context that when I hit puberty, I, so uh, I, I grew up in, in, in church spaces, which means that I grew up going to youth group, right? And sometimes in youth group, this happened in Indonesia too. Sometimes they would split the boys and the girls up, which invariably meant that we were going to talk about sex. And they would be like, look, boys, we know what you're all going through. You want to look at pictures of naked women, but don't do it. And I was like, okay, no looking at pictures of naked women. And I discovered that I was remarkably good at not looking at pictures of naked women. I was so good at it that I started to feel like I was like the holiest 12 year old in the world because I was like, oh, you know, everybody's supposed to be going through this and I've been spared. I think it's just because I love Jesus so much. So, you know, eventually I realized, oh, no, I, I do have an experience of sexual attraction. It's just not the one that I was like trained for and braced for. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not attracted to, to, to women. I'm attracted to, to guys. And very quickly went from feeling like the holiest 12 year old in the world to feeling like the worst possible 12 year old in the world. You know, the, the, the one who was so bad that nobody had bothered to warn me that somebody like me could exist. And, and maybe I'll, I'll pause here to, to give us a little side note about language, because as you mentioned, like even, even the fact that I, you know, use a word like gay to describe my experience of being attracted to the same sex is kind of a, you know, a point of debate among people. There's, there's lots of different views among Christians around the question of if you're somebody who is, you know, following Jesus, who reads the Bible and comes to the conviction that marriage is meant to be between male and female and sex is meant to be reserved for the union of marriage, and yet you are also attracted to the same sex, like, what language do you put around that experience? You know, do you just not talk about it at all? Which I think has for many people been kind of the, the default expectation, like just don't talk about it. But I think, I think a lot of us know, certainly those, I mean, Asher, you've written about men struggling with, with lust in, in a heterosexual capacity. And I would trust one of the things you've learned in your own journey and your own studies on the subject is that just hiding it away and not talking about what you're wrestling with with anybody is really not like a good path toward holiness. Like there's something really valuable about finding ways of naming your experience and being able to acknowledge it with your siblings in Christ so that you can be challenged and encouraged and invited into holiness. So so anyway, so so we find this we find ourselves in this tricky place of of needing language but then then wrestling with well of the imperfect language available to me, what do I call myself? Because on the one hand, I think in a lot of Christian spaces, the preferred language for somebody who's attracted to the same sex and choosing either to pursue singleness and celibacy or choosing to pursue an opposite sex relationship, maybe even though they're not particularly attracted to folks of the opposite sex, often the preferred term in Christian spaces for that experience is same sex attracted. The challenge with the term same-sex attracted is that it rose to prominence as part of the, the ex-gay movement, which I'll talk about momentarily in relation to my own story. But I'll say just for the moment that the, the ex-gay movement, for various reasons, has caused a lot of hurt for a lot of people over the years. And so there are reasons why folks tend to be really leery of that language because it carries a lot of baggage with it. Mm. Of course, a word like gay also carries a lot of baggage with it. It's just a different set of baggage. It is, however, for for most of the world, especially outside of the church, the word gay is the most common word used to describe the experience of being attracted to the same sex. That's that's what it means for most folks. And I think specifically for me, by the time I was putting language around my experience of sexuality, I was in grad school at a, you know, a, a public uh, state university and a lot of my friends who were not Christians in the grad school context 
their understanding of Christianity was that if you were gay, which they understood to mean attracted to the same sex, if you were gay, that made it impossible for you to follow Jesus. Like there was something fundamentally incompatible about the experience of being attracted to the same sex and the experience of being a Christian. That was what they heard when people said things like, you can't be gay and Christian. And so I found myself thinking in the context of that space, is there language that I can use that really helps recognize that that's where a lot of my grad school friends are in their understanding right now and says, actually, no, it's really, really possible to find yourself attracted to the same sex and follow Jesus. Mm. And I know because I am. So anyway, uh, all that to say, language is a really tricky and messy thing. And, and rightfully, you know, there's, there's co good conversation happening around what language is most helpful. If you want to get really deep in the weeds, there's a, there's a whole blog dialogue that I did with a friend of mine named Rachel Gilson, who prefers for herself the term same-sex attracted. And you can find that on the, the website of the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender. Even, I don't know if you do show notes, Asher, but yeah. if Asher does show notes, he'll put a link in the show <laughs> notes for you and you can, you can find it there. Anyway, all that to say, for now, uh, as I continue this story, just do me a favor and like, if you if you hear me use the word gay and you feel like, I don't know that that's the best word, go ahead and just put an asterisk next to the word or cross it out in your brain and plant in whatever word you think is more helpful. And, and that that's that's totally fine for the time being. It, so, yeah, that's a that's a long discursus on language that you didn't ask for, but but maybe helpful in sort of laying yeah. the, laying the land here. No, I, I appreciate that. Just to clarify, am I hearing you say that that you you chose the word gay largely to resonate with other people who are experiencing the same thing so that they can see that, hey, I can be Christian even while experiencing same-sex attraction. And yet you also didn't want to use language that would hurt them or like bring up other, am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, there, yeah. Were, there, there, were, there were friends I had who either were not Christian and had never been and felt like, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm gay. So obviously I couldn't be a Christian. And I also uh, had some friends and have some friends who had spent a lot of time in church spaces being told that if they really love Jesus, that needed to turn them into people who were attracted to the opposite sex that was supposed to make them straight. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't happen, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know people who attempted suicide because they felt like, there was something so fundamentally wrong with them because they weren't able to conjure up this attraction for the opposite sex. And so, yeah, just, just a lot of, a lot of hurt that was done by, I think, well-meaning people uh, in the name of Jesus, people saying, yes, Jesus is guaranteed to make you straight if you really love him, which therefore means if you don't turn out to be straight, if you can't conjure up enough attraction to the opposite sex, that must mean that you don't really love Jesus or he doesn't really love you. And so, yeah, I think, I think there's been, there's been some, some really significant harm done. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. pe people who have taken their lives because of messages like that. And so I, I was trying to think through how can I communicate in a way that's hopefully maximally likely to communicate the truth of the gospel to folks who, yeah, folks who have some of that, some of that baggage around a term like same sex attracted. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Hey friends, this podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Dwell app. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Dwell audio Bible app, but this app is phenomenal. It It's changed my life in several different ways. As a Bible college student, I do tremendous amounts of Bible reading throughout the semester, more than I normally do. And I'm not a fast reader. And so one of the ways that I have been able to keep on top of the Bible reading is through the Dwell app. One, one of the things I really like about it is there's very meditative, reflective music played in the background of the reader. So it's not dramatized. Some, some audio Bible apps are dra dramatized and that's a little, I don't know, not my cup of tea. But it's a very calming and just peaceful way of having the Bible read to you. There's also, there's at least 15, I think there's close to 30 by now, different voices that you can choose from. There's many different translations you can choose from. For the ESV, I think there's maybe two or three voices, if that makes sense. But there's 
over 15 voices for sure. And so you can have a female voice, you can have a male voice, you can have a British accent, you can have an American accent, you can have a Canadian accent or a, well, I like the British accent. So I listen to the Bible in the British accent and it's it's been a really good way to keep on top of my homework but also I have found sometimes I'll be listening to audio Bible as I commute someplace or as I'm doing some other work or even in the morning sometimes it's hard to wake up you're tired and to sit down and read it literally feels like an intellectual exercise you're just it's like school like starting your day with school and I love learning things but I'm not like I don't do well at starting my day with school and so when you wake up and you're tired but you want you want to meditate on the word of God to just put in my air airpods and listen to the dwell app is an incredible way to start my morning just in peaceful worship meditation I hear things differently when I hear it being read than when I read it I personally think you should read and hear it both, but that's one thing I like about Audio Bible is different things stick out that didn't stand out before. I'll listen to it as I'm going on a run or something, and I can't say enough good about the Dwell app. And so if you would like to take your meditation, your Bible reading to another level, you can also, if you're not able to sleep at night, you can put in your AirPods and and listen to the scripture being read and fall to sleep that way I've used that at times as well but you can start for free there's a link in the description below or you can go ahead and purchase the the annual plan which I have and it's to me it's very much worth it just in the way a couple things the way it helps me uh, meditate and kind of a fresh view a fresh experience with scripture and then also the way it helps me keep on top of my homework it's been very helpful for me so anyway, so with that, with that, you know, with that, with that linguistic understanding in mind, now that we've defined our terms just a just a teensy bit, I'll jump back into my own story. So, so here I am, you know, coming to grips with, I am attracted to the same sex, whatever language, I wasn't putting any language around it at that point, because I wasn't talking to anybody about it. But I, I did, I lived in, I lived in a broadly evangelical culture uh, subculture to, to be clear, Indonesia is majority Muslim, but the, but the subculture that I was within kind of had two prevailing narratives around what you could do if you were gay and wanted to be a follower of Jesus, right? One of them was this ex gay narrative that said, if you figure out what went wrong in your upbringing and then pray about it, Jesus wants to fix you and make you straight. And then the other narrative was, was this, this narrative that affirmed same sex marriage that said, oh no, you just need to revisit the biblical text, you know, wrestle with the passages and you'll conclude that actually there is room for you as a follower of Jesus to pursue a same-sex marriage. Certainly the the one of those narratives that was more pr- prevalent in my community was this ex-gay narrative. And so that was the that was the attitude, the assumption that I lived within for quite a while, trying to measure the state of my spiritual growth on the basis of how straight I felt at any given time which led me to do some wild things along the way. Uh, like one time I remember, and this by the way, is not a recommendation, not a how to, but I remember one time running across a picture of like a scantily clad woman and thinking to myself, you know, I've been told that if I love Jesus, I would be straight. And I've also been told that if I were straight and I saw a picture like this of a scantily clad woman, like I would feel things, you know, I would want to lust after this picture. And I was like, I'm going for it. So I remember taking the picture and just like staring it down, being like, I will. And, you know, it, it did not for all the good it did. I might as well have been staring at an office supplies poster. But this was this logic that was so deeply ingrained in me. It was like, if you really love Jesus and if he's really at work in your life, he must therefore give mm. you an attraction to the opposite sex and remove any, you know, experience of attraction that you have to the same sex. And that just didn't happen in my life. So yeah, I reached a crisis point sometime after college where I uh, realized, you know, I I am growing more deeply in my faith. I'm falling more deeply in love with Jesus. And those things are not causing me to to become straight. And so then I really wrestled deeply with with this other narrative that I had heard, the the narrative that affirmed same-sex marriage, and found myself on the one hand, like deeply, viscerally sympathetic to it, but still not 
still not intellectually persuaded by it, it still seemed to me that even though there was a lot of complexity in that conversation, that there was still this this best answer within scripture that deserved to be pursued. And that best mm. answer, as I understood mm. it, was, like I said before, the understanding that marriage for followers of Jesus is designed to be between male and female. And that, you know, those of us who are not married are called to celibacy. Uh, and, and so... I mean, when I, when I first arrived at that conclusion, I was like, okay, I think this, I think this will be manageable. I think I can do this, but God, I am never going to tell anybody about this. So, so the, the dream was like, I'm going to die and nobody's going to know that I'm gay, which obviously at this point in my life has worked out very well for me. But yeah, I, the, the Lord has, the Lord has shifted some things in my heart since then. I, that was probably mm. about 10 years ago that I first reach that conclusion of like, okay. okay, I think I'm probably going to be single for my entire life. And I, and at the time I thought, I'll just, anytime somebody asks why I'm single, I'll just say, you know, I feel the Lord calling me to singleness for right now, but he's welcome to change my mind anytime. And I sort of left open for people the possibility that like, oh, we should still set you up with our daughters and granddaughters. Um, <laughs> Uh, cause evangelicals love to match make, you know, they're just so into matchmaking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there came a point in my life where I, I began to feel compelled by God to, to communicate a bit more openly about mm -hmm. this aspect of my experience and why it was that I, how it was that God had made so clear to me this, this calling to singleness. And so that turned into a book that I accidentally wrote one summer um, and then publishing the book that I accidentally wrote. And, you know, six ish years later, he here we are. Here um, we are. And yeah. yes, my, my experience of sexuality is no longer a secret to anyone who wants to know uh, for yeah. better or worse. Yeah, no, I know a, a little bit of what, what that's like. You put something out like that and then everybody knows your deepest, darkest secrets what was it that kind of brought you to become okay coming out of the closet? I know in the book you you talk about different experiences you had where it kind of accidentally came out or yeah, like how, how would, what brought you to come out of the closet and what would you say to other people who are kind of in that stage? Like they've recognized they're gay, but they don't really want to talk to anybody about it. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I think there are two, when it comes to coming out, or uh, again, for those of you who don't love the language of coming out, maybe you have similar objections to that as you do to the word gay. Here, anytime I say the word coming out, or the phrase coming out, you can just imagine, you know, cross that out and put in being open about one's experience of sexual attraction. So, uh, yeah, I think there are two really different coming out conversations. One is, and both are important questions to ask, but I, they're worth tackling separately. One is the question of, am I coming out to anybody at all? Like, am I known by some people who are, you know, close mm -hmm. to me? And then there's the separate question of like, broadly coming out to the world and just having your attraction be like a fact of common knowledge that you're not really trying to hide from anybody at any time. So the 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 decision to to have a few trustworthy people know i mean in my own life that happened really haphazardly at first like you were saying Asha, like my early coming out conversations were like somebody asked me a question and i didn't have a good alternate answer and so i was like uh well i'm gay so um and you know and then you know and then it was awkward and then we had to work through it for, in a 2 hour conversation the thing that caused me to start intentionally coming out to folks. Uh, actually, it was, I remember having one of those really interesting conversations with Jesus. I would have been 24 at the time. Um, I'd gone out on one of those long walks and it was, I think, late evening or something, and it was really breezy. And I was just having a conversation with Jesus and and saying to Jesus, like, I, I want to be really willing to do anything that you want me to do. And I remember Jesus asking me really clearly, like, does that include, like, talking to people about your sexuality, mm -hmm. like, admitting to people mm -hmm. that you're gay? And I was like, oh, maybe not that. 
Um, because at that point, again, my dream is like, I'm going to die and people aren't going to know that I'm gay. And obviously if that's your dream, like you need to tell as few people as possible. But I remember Jesus just saying like, let's, let's put a pin in that and maybe think about that a little more. And so I think a reality that I started to wrestle with was the reality that there was something really important about having that part of my life be known at least by somebody, because I think when, when no one is aware of that aspect of your experience, it can be really easy to hear people say like, I love you, you know, um, and to hear their love with an asterisk next to it. That makes you wonder like, well, they think they love me, but they think they love me as a straight person. And like, would they still feel the same way? Like, would they still respect and admire me in the way they do right now if they actually knew sort of the totality of my experience. And it seems to me that there's something fundamental about the human experience where we're designed to know the fullness of the love of God by experiencing that through other people, right? When, when God in, in, in early Genesis says to Adam, like, it's not good for the man to be alone. Like, let's make another one of these. There's a lot going on in that passage, obviously, but I don't think he's just saying like procreation is a two player game. Like we got to populate this place. I think he's also saying like that, uh, that for human beings, like, yes, Adam is already in perfect relationship with God and that's beautiful, but there's also a sense in which Adam needs in fleshed companionship, um, mm. Mm -hmm. like he needs other human beings, other images of God through whom he can see the God in whose image he has created. And so I think it's really important that we, that we be able to see the face of God by, by seeing it reflected in, in one another. And so in that sense, as long as we're sort of completely hidden away from everybody feeling like, oh, I can't, I can't be fully known by anybody because that would be too dangerous. Then I think we wind up in a state where it's as if we're also trying to hide ourselves away from God in some regard. And that too is a, is a very human tendency that has existed since the beginning, right? We see in Genesis three, the very first human impulse after sin enters the world is to hide themselves away, right? Adam and Eve hear God coming and they're like, oh crap, we just did a bad thing. And so they hide. And, and so the first question that God asked to humankind post fall is, where are you? And so, so, it, so anyway, it, it seems to me that there's, that there's a lot of value. There's a lot of even spiritual necessity in being able to make your whole self known, not necessarily to everybody, but like at least to a few trustworthy people who can see all of you and affirm to you, like the love of God and help encourage you in your desire to be obedient to God. It seems to me that things that live in the dark tend to accrue shame and it's really hard it's really hard to grow in the dark um yeah so that would be my case for like coming out at least a little bit to a few people as to as to coming out broadly that that was a decision that i made here's here's how it happened for me so i was i was coming out to like a few very select people you know i had just finally had the first intentional coming out conversation i ever had which was to the pastor of my church because i was like I would like to think through what it looks like to do this well as a follower of Jesus. And he seems like somebody who I would want to talk to about that. And then uh, maybe a, a couple months after that, I came out to my parents because I felt like they also were people I wanted to be able to have those kinds of conversations with. But I was keeping it small. Meanwhile, I was trying to write a novel. And I had terrible writer's block that summer. And so I told my agent, I had an agent at this point in my life for other reasons that are uh, not relevant to our current story. I told my agent, I was like, Mike, I've got terrible writer's block. And he was like, here's what you got to do, Coles. You got to sit down with your blank computer page and just write whatever comes out of you. And no one ever has to see it. And I was like, this is sound writerly advice. So I did. Uh, and because it just so happened that that summer I had, I was just beginning to come out to a few people. I was processing a lot of stuff about what my life had looked like in the past and what I thought maybe it would look like in the future. And so those were the things that came onto the page as I wrote whatever came out of me. And so I wrote and wrote and wrote. And at the end of the summer, I was like, oh no, I think I wrote a book. So yeah. So, so then I sat with the book and I was like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like, do we burn it? Do we hide it in the archive to collect digital dust forever? I don't know. 
but there were a few have you ever i mean you're a, you're a creative man you're a, a fellow writer um do you ever write one of those sentences and you're like that was a good sentence like i just wrote a really really good sentence you know i think a lot of art artistic creative types do this right yeah. like like you draw something or you like you bake something and you're like this is so like the world needs this it's so amazing so the long and short of it is i had written this thing and i was like i actually think this has like some real artistic merit to it and so there was this part of me that was like is this valuable and i was like ah but it seems really risky is it worth it but these sentences the world needs these sentences and so in the end, I, I wound up showing it to a couple of, again, a couple trustworthy people initially. And I was like, I don't know mm -hmm. what to do with this. And all of those trustworthy people said, I think there might be something really useful here for people other than you. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, in the interest of uh, trying to be helpful to others, I decided to publish that book. So through my agent, you know, wound up with a book contract. And so then I have a contract for this book that's going to come out, but I am not, I'm out to like 20 people in the world at that point. But I was like, well, this time next year, I will be uh, as out as anyone wants me to be. You know, you can Google my name and discover. So I made a list of like a hundred people who I was like, these people have been important to me at some point in my life. I should probably have a conversation with them before this book comes out. So I started reaching out to them. I sent a lot of emails, you know, had some coffee dates and some phone conversations. And, and then when the pre-order link to my book became available on Amazon, I just took the link and I posted it to Facebook and I wrote, dear friends, I'm delighted to announce that I have a book coming out. Also, here are a few other things you should know. And that was my, yeah, I remember hitting the, hitting the, the button to post that Facebook post. And then as soon as I posted it, I like slammed down the lid of my laptop and I shoved myself back against my chair and I breathed really, really hard as if I was climbing the climb hill of a roller coaster. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Wild times. So that yeah. part of the journey, you know, the like coming out broadly to the world, that it seems to me is a question that an individual needs to wrestle with in the context of what other big things God seems to be doing in their life. Mm -hmm. Right? Who who their story might benefit if they decide to be more public about their experience. And on the other hand, maybe the ways in which being publicly known in that way would create greater personal challenge for them, that it seems like God is not asking them to inflict upon themselves, or maybe would uh, be an impediment to some of the other work that, that God is wanting them to do in the world. So yeah, I, I would want to encourage people to to be really thoughtful and prayerful in how they wrestle through that question. But I would say at the very least, find a few trustworthy people who, who can yeah. know all of you in that regard. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. Thanks for sharing. I, you, you said a lot in there that I'd like to unpack more, but maybe, maybe just to go back to the beginning of your story, like one of the things that I've heard is especially in communities maybe that don't actually know people. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think this is gracious, or I think it's fair to say, is this concept that like people who are gay come from, like they've been, like maybe their, their dad was passive and their mom was mm -hmm. super aggressive or like they come from really dysfunctional home and and obviously, I think like sometimes sexual abuse can can play into it at, to a certain degree. But like what? Yeah, what would what would you say? Like, obviously, you you came from a normal, healthy missionary family. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my parents are delightful. I, I I challenge anyone listening to this to to meet my parents and then figure out what the big problem with my parents is that is supposed to have you know made me gay. I think. Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, what we know about the 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 science of sexual orientation, if you will, the 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 patterns that seem to be involved in how people turn out to be attracted to the same sex or the opposite sex or both sexes or really not attracted to anybody or literally attracted to everybody, right? Or like all the all the different variations that that people's attraction can have, there are there are some factors that I mean, a lot of people feel highly incentivized either to try to prove this is sort of all nature and no nurture, right? Like 
people are just mm. just born gay period you know some people feel really incentivized to try to push all the data in that direction and then on the other hand there are people who really strongly want to prove like this is all nurture like it's just if you raise your children right they were guaranteed to be straight and i would say neither of those neither of those views quite lines up with the, the data we actually have two really easy points of data that like demonstrate why neither of those narratives quite w works on the one side we have identical twin studies right so identical twins who share the same genetic material the same womb environment the same wash of hormones and so forth while they're in the womb they can be after they're born i mean identical twins are more likely than other siblings to both be gay or both be straight or what have you but they're still not 100 percent like you have plenty of cases where you've got identical twins same genetic material one winds up gay or bi or queer the other uh turns out to be straight um mm. so it can't mm. be all genetics in that case a and on the other hand there are studies that demonstrate that the more biological or the more sons a woman gives birth to the more likely her subsequent sons are to be gay just statistically like the more older brothers a biological male has the more likely that biological male is to be gay so i for instance have two uh biological older brothers and so sometimes when i'm in a spicy mood i like to joke that it's my older brother's fault that i'm gay and of course to, to imply that it's it's a fault to be gay as if there's something you know terribly dreadful about my experience of sexuality it's a bit tongue-in-cheek but but yeah any any so so what we see is there's some complex interplay right there's there's some sort of like genetic and or like womb and hormone components that factor into how somebody winds up experiencing attraction but there's also stuff having to do with their experience of the world and upbringing and we don't have any simple answer mm. and again mm. lots of people will try to feed you a simple answer for all kinds of reasons whether because it's politically expedient on one side or the other of the political aisle or because it fits with what they believe religiously needs to be the case mm. it seems to me if i may opine on the subject it seems to me that every experience of sexual attraction that we know today is in some way fallen right so so on the one hand like i would say the 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 fact that i experience attraction toward people of the same sex who again i'm i'm not married to them and my understanding is that there's you know theologically as a follower of jesus i am called to not be married to somebody of the same sex so i would say that like those experiences of sexual attraction are consequence of the fallenness of humankind but i would also say that if i you know talking to a straight man who rumor has it, you know, straight men tend to experience the capacity for like sexual attraction or sexual temptation toward women who they are not married to. And that it seems to me is also a reflection of human fallenness. Mm -hmm. And I conversely, as somebody who's super gay in the sense that like I experience absolutely zero attraction for women, you could, you could drop me in a room full of naked women and I would be like, oh, look, my dearly loved sisters in the Lord, you know? And, and so in that sense, I actually, don't see that component of my experience as as necessarily a consequence of fallenness that it seems to me is a really handy and beautiful thing in 21st century america when when all the media around me is like oh here's like a male in his early 30s let's throw pictures of naked women in it, at him and i'm like i am totally immune to any kind of temptation in that regard and so yeah i think i think if we had room theologically to see all of our experiences of sexuality as being in some way fallen in some way broken and yet also all of our experiences as being reflective of the fingerprints of a god who put us together you know in in his original design and said like oh hot dang like that's really good and so i think once we make that acknowledgement like look we're all we are all sexually screwed up in our own unique ways then it becomes much less of a theological crisis to need to figure out like okay wait was i was I born this way? Was this a nurture thing? Like, whose fault was yeah. this? Do I blame God? Do I blame my parents? Do I blame, you know, like, we don't really need to figure that out because the experience of saying, oh, there's some stuff in my life that I am called to say no to is like a, a remarkably normal and human experience. And so, yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think once we get too caught up in trying to figure out what makes people gay or what makes people straight, 
we've lost the thread of the narrative because the narrative is, look, we're all going to, in our own unique ways, find challenges as we follow Jesus. And we're all going to find unique beauties and opportunities as we pursue Jesus. And it's not really our job to determine why the challenges and the beauties are the way they are. Our job is to lean into the pursuit of Jesus in the midst of those things. Yeah. When people some, sometimes in conversations with, about this with people, I have heard some folks equate basically uh, same sex attraction to lust, like heterosexual lust. Mm. And yeah, what do, do you have thoughts on that? Like, how, oh, how, yeah. how do we parse out attraction as opposed to lust? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I would want to, I would want to distinguish between really three different things. One is what I would call orientation, by which I mean a general pattern of attraction over time. And I would want to distinguish mm. that from a particular experience of attraction. And then I would want to distinguish that attraction from lust. So, so the distinction between those three things, when I, so orientation, like when I, when I say that I'm gay or even my friends who prefer a term like same-sex attracted, when they say I am same-sex attracted, they're speaking to a general pattern over time, right? They're not saying at this exact moment, I am necessarily experiencing an attraction to the same sex, right? Like for instance, you know, right now, uh, Asher, you know, you and I are sitting here having a conversation. You're the only other man in the room and you know, you're very handsome and all, but I'm not currently experiencing any same sex attraction to you. So, mm -hmm. so when I say that I'm gay in this moment, I'm not saying I'm actively experiencing attraction. What I'm saying is I've noticed this pattern over the course of my life that if I am going to be attracted to somebody, it seems that it is going to be a man. So then, so then I would want to distinguish that again from the, the specific experience of attraction. But it seems to me that the specific experience of attraction also needs to be distinguished from lust because a specific experience of attraction, it seems to me, it includes within it sexual temptation, right? Like within attraction, there are ways of responding to attraction that you could go from noticing somebody to like noticing somebody, you know? And and that 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 point of shift is it seems to me the point where you're responding to sexual temptation and responding to it in a way that is sinful. But scripturally, we have lots of lots of reasons to suggest that the experience of temptation is not itself a sin, right? We, uh, we see Jesus being tempted, uh, and then, you know, the author of Hebrews commentates and says, Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin, right? We're, uh, we're promised in scripture that when we're tempted, God will give us a way out so that we don't have to sin. And so I think it would be remarkably defeatist of us, and it would miss that that hopefulness of Scripture to say, like, oh, yeah, like, the moment you experience temptation, like, you're already in sin, so, you know, sucks to be you, right? The, 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 the biblical narrative is temptation offers us an opportunity to sin or an opportunity to honor God by, by saying no to sin. And so I think we need to distinguish between any experience of attraction, right, whether it's toward somebody of the same sex or toward somebody of the opposite sex that you're not married to. All of those experiences, you know, include within them the capacity for sexual temptation, but that doesn't make them actual lustful activities. And and again, I think for, to my understanding, the distinction between those two things is the, the point of willfulness, right? Like the moment at which your will figures out how you're going to respond. Am I going to respond to this in a way that says, no, I will not turn this person into an object for my own pleasure. Or are you going to respond in a way that says, oh, yes, let me let me turn that person into into an object for me. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, hopefully, hopefully that's that's helpful in distinguishing those things. There, there's there's a number of different questions that we could kind of go around, even even the, the whole concept of like, why, why define yourself with an adjective, an adjective at all? But I'm, I'm just going to defer people. Um, Greg writes about that in his book. And I'll drop a link for it. Um, single gay Christian. Thanks for listening, friends. That was part one of my conversation with Greg Coles. And next week, I will release part two where we talk about community and intimacy and what it means to belong and how, how can you find intimacy outside of sexual relationships as well. If you would like to look up Greg Coles for yourself, 
and follow his work, you can do so at gregcoles.com or gregorycoles.com. I believe both of them go to the same place. You can also purchase any of his books on Amazon and he you can follow his work and in, in the Center for Faith Sexuality's work at centerforfaith.com. Thanks for listening and see you again next week.